Monday is the 77th anniversary of Jackie Robinson's debut in Major League Baseball. When he took first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers, Robinson ended 80 years of segregation in baseball. But decades earlier, a team of black players was making a name for themselves in the independent leagues of the Midwest. Now, nearly 100 years later, those players and their contribution to baseball are getting their due and inspiring a new generation of ball players. Charlie DeMar has their story. Dip it in here and then kind of roll it off. With each drop of paint, a lesser known history is spread at the Boys and Girls Club in South Bend, Indiana. They didn't at first play, all play baseball. Nearly 100 years after they played, names like Mitchell, Thomas Poindexter, John Big Pitch Williams, and Dusty Riddle are all getting another at bat. They were foundry giants. The men played on an all-black baseball team made up of workers from the Studebaker Car Factory. They played mostly white teams in South Bend's Industrial League in the 1920s and 30s, decades before Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball. Lots of different types of pinstripes and... Is it hard to touch? Oh, absolutely. The team's rich history was recovered at the University of Notre Dame's Hesburgh Library. We have the one photo of the foundry giants from the 1920s and have no other references. Using that single black and white picture of the team and catalogs of uniforms from the time, design professor Clint Carlson and students like Kaya Jones began to reimagine what the Giants uniforms looked like. Now we're able to look at stuff from the 1920s and see, you know, what were people wearing? What were the stylistic choices at that time? Part of the reason for telling this history is because it's a history of resilience and strength. The time period that they lived in not dissimilar sometimes to some of the issues we face today. Jones is a senior at Notre Dame majoring in Africana studies and design. We made a lot of stencils for these designs that you see. She learned about the Giants last year and now works on the project as a research assistant and helps lead workshops like these at the Boys and Girls Club, talking with kids about race, representation and access. There was more to them than just being a baseball player. They were vital people to the community who made a significant push for black rights in South Bend. Is that what stood out to you about their story? Yeah, that's definitely what stood out to me. Knuckles to the sky, got a point like that. That unique history now lives at Foundry Field, a South Bend park that was somewhat forgotten, just like the Giants. Now go. both are getting the applause they deserve. Oh! Oh! The public park is slated to open September 1st. So far, the project has raised over $200,000 and wants to raise $500,000 more. That money is needed for stands, lighting, and improvements to the field. What do you remember about doing this? Was it fun? Yeah. On the outfield wall, there's a mural highlighting the work of underrepresented artists and the faces of giants who were overlooked painted by kids who, in large part, haven't been part of America's pastime. Okay, who can do that all in one motion? Me, me. I'm committed to making sure that young black people get a chance to play the game that my father loved, that my father taught me. Milt Lee is the community director of athletics for South Bend Schools and a partner on the Foundry Field Project. He says this diamond represents inclusion and equity in the game of baseball. I see so many kids who just don't have the skill set, they don't have the mentors, they don't have the access, they don't have the equipment. This field and these people can help provide that for these kids. And maybe grow some major leaguers right here maybe in South Bend. Grow some major leaguers right here in South Bend. <laughs> a baseball field devoted to honoring forgotten and marginalized teams of old. On your mark, get set, go! go. Now go a first. symbol of what's possible. For CBS Saturday Morning, Charlie DeMar, South Bend, Indiana. And baseball is that for so many kids. I remember when my son, he was a butterfinger. But when he learned to throw and catch that ball, his world changed. His friends changed. It was just <laughs> an, a game changer. It's a, Sports is an opening. It, I was just thinking that, that that's one of the things I love about it. Like, look at, at all those different angles from it, from sports, mm -hmm. all from sports. Sports is life-changing. I love it so much. Mm -hmm. In a couple weeks, the final leg of NASCAR's Triple Truck Challenge wraps up, and one of the sport's youngest drivers has already clinched his spot in the postseason, Raja Karuth. He's got one win under his belt and is one of only a handful of series regulars with several top 10 finishes this year. Skylar Henry rode along with a college senior to talk about the momentum of his career on and off the track.
Raja Karuth will take the white flag. One lap to go. Raja Karuth is used to life in the fast lane. Behind the wheel of the number 71 Chevy race truck, reaching triple digit speeds. There it is. Raja Karuth wins it at Las Vegas. He's training at the General Motors Tech Center, just north of Charlotte, both in their gym, maintaining muscle and coordination, Thanks. and inside a state-of-the-art racing simulator, where it's all about finding the feel. My freeness, I got like a quarter number of freeness back in three and four. Three and four, is, there's probably a little bit there, but just managing your one and two. Every minute detail yeah. counts. About a dozen of Carruth's crewmates, including crew chief Chad Walter, track each turn in the control room. He's pretty good in this thing as far as feedback, and uh, you know, this is kind of his background as far as his beginnings in racing, so he does a really good job. Carruth began his racing career at 16 behind a computer screen, spending hours with an iRacing video game. He grew up in Washington, D.C., more than an hour from the nearest NASCAR track. What's up? What's up, man? I caught up with the now 22-year-old en route to his team shop. Is there like a driver that you like were locked into or were you just a fan of the sport in general? Uh, both. So, I mean, I was just a huge fan of the sport period, like of just being a student of it. I got this en encyclopedia when I was like seven. When he was 12, he made it to his first race. I just was obsessed with it. And so my first favorite driver was Jimmy Johnson. He just carried himself like a champion. And so that was really infectious and got to spend a little time with him and his family mm -hmm. last year. And so that was really special because it's like the man you grow up watching and idolizing on television and to have a personal relationship with him is pretty cool. Yeah, That's like the opposite of when they say like, never meet your heroes. You're like, nah, he checks out. A hundred percent. While a student of the sport, he's also studying full-time for a degree in motorsports management at nearby Winston-Salem State University. Every day I'm like, man, I could just like pause and, and But you're so close it. to the finish line. Right, and that's you know? what everybody keeps saying, so I, I, I toss and turn about it every day. But part of that education has been life itself here at Spire Motorsports. Looking at your truck, there's a lot of work that goes into it. What is that process like? There's so many minor details that uh, the men and women here, and not just at Spire, but at every race team, they they fine tune, they tweak. I'm the one that gets to drive and it's really special, but it's not just me out there uh, mm -hmm. that I'm racing for. Caruth is keenly aware of the team's efforts, even after a big win. Banners up, trophies in the case. How does that feel? I think more relieving than anything, just because you think about going through the winter and there's a missed uncertainty, like your your shop guys are showing up every day at seven in the morning and here till, till after four. And the, as drivers, we do our thing. So to have an accolade, a, a good result, a, a tangible one is very, very good. As for how the sixth ranked driver in NASCAR's Craftsman Truck Series prepares for race day, my important thing, I, I always get like eggs and, and pancakes to start, which is mostly every day, but definitely on race days as well. Um, like four eggs and one or two pancakes and chocolate milk, like that's my thing. Chocolate milk? Chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk, yeah. Caruth's father, Roger, is usually with him at the table. I'm generally an early riser, so I'm always up and prepped because he can call and be like, hey, let's go to breakfast in 30 minutes. And then from there, he's going to eat and go to the track. Roger travels from his day job as a Howard University professor to every one of Raza's races. For the older Caruth, it's about getting through the journey together as a family. As a parent, like how can you support the effort, whatever it is? So mm -hmm. There's no kind of apprehension, any thought either way. It was just a matter of like, what, what does it take? Mm -hmm. And what did it take? Uh, still trying to figure that out, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of time, effort, but within any sport, you know, you have to make some type of commitment where some balance has to be shifted, um, particularly if someone is really invested in it. And it seems Raja was since those early video game days. How does someone take what you found with iRacing and allow that to be your North Star, your guide into this? That's an interesting question because my whole purpose behind starting racing online was to get my foot into the door to race period. Do you know how to drive a manual? No, but I'm counting on you to hold me down. So I had to give it a try myself. And now you're done with the clutch. OK. 
Okay. And then start hitting the gas. You can hit the gas more than when you start here at like, uh -huh. you go to third. There you go. Yep. You can hit the gas, bro. Yeah. You don't have to ship no more. Okay. Yeah. And use two hands to drive. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to break it. Yup. <laughs> oh, snap. Well, well, now you, oh. Your car has too much damage. We've got to fix it. It just told me that well, the car has too much damage. <laughs> we have to fix it. Safe to say, it's best to leave it to the professional. When you're operating on a track and you're hitting your top speeds inside of your truck, how fast are you going? 180, 185, maybe a little more. Does it slow down for you? You could say that, you yeah. could say that. It's to the point where it's not easy, but it's natural. Mm -hmm. As for his future hopes, you sort of have become an ambassador of sorts, if you will, for more inclusivity, more diversity, in a way that I think many people probably didn't think of five, 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. The, the passion for the sport uh, has been the main thing for me, and I know what I represent, and that's, I cherish that responsibility, you know? So I feel like I'm just showing people the sport and showing you know, our culture the sport and just its legitimacy, because it's fun. For CBS Saturday Morning, Skyler Henry, Concord, North Carolina. Cool, under pressure, man. Yeah. He just seems like he has the confidence to go all the well, way. Seems like wise beyond his years. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And you can see that it's also in part because of his family and how close yeah, they are. totally. I got to say, I love the fact that iRacing is what got him there, but it's really chocolate milk that seems to be the <laughs> secret that has kept him there. That's the key. That's, that's the best part. The, the pre-race routine, four eggs, uh -huh. a, pancake, a pancake, two pancakes. One or two. A one or two. And chocolate milk. <laughs> what How can you go you wrong? Breakfast of champions. Yeah. But I just have to say, Skylar, great piece, but uh, you should know how to drive a man. I'm just saying. <laughs> This morning on The Dish, Crystal Wilkinson, award-winning author, scholar, and former Kentucky Poet Laureate. In her latest book, part cookbook, part memoir, praise song for the kitchen ghost, she takes readers to the mountains and kitchens of the Appalachian region. I've always felt a power larger than myself while cooking. I learned how to cook by saying nothing. When author Crystal Wilkinson recounts her childhood and her new book, she conjures those from whom she inherited her kitchen culture. So much of the art of cooking lies in the body. I gain knowledge about the spirit of the cooks who came before me, the rhythm and the way they sloshed the greens in the sink, removed a pot seconds before it burned, drew a knife close enough to the finger to hold the vegetable taut but never cut themselves. A kind of electric excitement passed through me when I watched Granny cook. Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghost is a tribute to the ancestors of Indian Creek, Kentucky, but mostly Wilkinson's granny. This was the kitchen ghost. Yes. If not for her dress, she says it may have never been written. Well, it entered into my life when my grandmother passed away and how hard that was. You know, it was so hard, even though I knew how to cook. That first holiday, which was Thanksgiving, and, and thinking about, uh, well, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to do this? I was cooking for my mother and my three children and struggling, breaking down, crying, um, trying to do all the things. You know, my grandmother had seven children. She had 25 grandchildren several great grandchildren and we would all gather in that little house mm. and I got her dress and I hung it up on the back door and I felt like that at that moment she was like okay girl you you can do this. Praise song is also an ode to Afrolatcha, Wilkinson's term of recognizing the African-American imprint on the culture and food of the southeastern mountain region known as Appalachia. Chicken and dumplings is my favorite Is it dish. really? Yeah. I like the universality of it. I like the fact that it is one of my comfort foods, and I know that at some point it was a struggle food for my people. We decided to have Crystal teach me how to make it. Then you'll put the chicken in. A dish that formally ended her two decades as a vegetarian, because no matter how hard she tried. Look at me. Look at you. She couldn't replicate a meatless version. It's good. Mm -hmm. 
other Appalachian favorites were easier to alter. This is the meatless greens, but you get a little smoky flavor from a liquid smoke. And those aren't just collards, those are... That's a mixture of uh, mustard, kale, and some collards in it too. Gotcha. Is there a difference between black Appalachian food and what we know as Appalachian? I think there's a bigger distinction between Appalachian food and Southern food. Mm. And the foods are different mainly because the terrain is so different. In the deep south, you can have a winter garden. Like you can still grow them collards in the winter. In Appalachia, you got snow, you've got ice. And so there's a bigger um, focus on preservation. The book also honors her family history. Like, Grandma Aggie, who was born in 1795 in Virginia and was brought to Kentucky as an enslaved woman. Grandma Aggie's daughter, Patsy Wright, graces the cover of the book. A child born free in 1818 to a white father, Tarleton Wilkinson. He also deeded property to her mother, as shown in records the family still possesses. Feather bedstead crocks and pots and pans and tables and everything that she sort of needed to, to set up a household. Clues Wilkinson believes shed light on their relationship. She was the, let's say, common law wife. So there were documents and I was able to find her through census records because he never took a white wife. Because marriage was illegal between whites yes. and blacks. The generations that followed lived off the land, including her beloved grandparents, who took her in as a young girl. I lived an idyllic childhood. You know, I think there's something about being grandparent raised. We were mm. home. I, like, I did a lot of running around, and my grandparents would say, yeah, go on. Go on and do what you wanted to do. So I think my imagination was instilled from roaming that land. My grandfather had 64 acres of land. 64 acres that provided food for her family's table. There are recipes she claims is her own, like her upside down cornbread. Which my grandmother would not have served, but oh, really? I have uh, innovated a little bit and put um, onion rings on the bottom of the skillet when you bake the cornbread. Um, that is garlicky white beans, uh, also vegetarian. And here you have dressed eggs. My grandmother, being a church woman, didn't often say deviled eggs because you don't want to speak the devil's mm. name. So this is dressed eggs. Dressed. Dressed or deviled, Crystal Wilkinson has lived her granny's wildest dreams. My grandmother always wanted to be um, a teacher and the women in praise song, the men too, but particularly the women are the reason that I am who I am. A scholar at the University of Kentucky, the state's poet laureate, and for that matter... So you're Appalachian now. I'm Appalachian. <laughs> a woman who knows her way around the kitchen. And so even though the dishes in the book might not be dishes that people are familiar with, I think it'll hearken them back to their own kitchen ghosts and their own traditions. I learned so much from her, especially all about dry so eggs. If you don't want to call them deviled <laughs> eggs, which is fine, why don't we just call them angelic eggs? Oh, mm. wow. Because they're a little naughty? I don't know. It's you think they're naughty? Well, because you get a little spice, right? From a little spice. She, she has a lot of kick in hers, but that and her mint berry lemonade are to die for. So, folks, hope you I got a little it. taste of Appalachia. You think it's hot? <laughs> You know me, my spice. mouth was full. You, you are good with that. You will too, yours is too. I think it's good. The Dish is sponsored by Oceana Cruises. Your world, your way.